Good evening. Welcome to Shuddersome, Tales of Poe. My name is Rosalie Mackenzie Poe. As you may have guessed, these stories were indeed written by my brother, my half-brother, Edgar Allan Poe. We're not folk in. I wish to make that perfectly clear. I'm told he's somewhat of a famous author. I wouldn't know. We're not close. I know very little about him. I hardly know why I stand before you this evening. The circumstances are not exactly. In fact, until today, I never experienced any of his work. Edgar was a strange boy. Not that I know exactly. Not that I'm familiar with that particular quality. Strangeness is quite unladylike. I'm told his stories are good, chilling, eerie, capable of giving one the shudders. Ladies should never shudder or experience fear. Strong emotions encourage perspiration. Perspiration is very unladylike. Frankly, I'm not convinced, knowing Edgar as I do, that he's capable of a good story, or even a frightening one. We shall see what we shall see. Let us begin the telltale heart. a stone. A stone. You never struck me nor insulted me. Good night. Uh, good night. It was the morning. It was never him at all. It was his eye. Uh, what's the matter? Sorry? You, what's the matter? You're staring. Nothing. Sorry. Lost in thought. Huh. Whenever his eye fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, I made up my mind. Take his life and his life up and die forever. Morning. Uh, good morning. Well? Like a stone. You think me mad? The man knows nothing. I know. I am wise. You'll see how wise I am. Uh, good night. See you in the morning. I was so kind to him before I killed him, the whole week, and then I'd practice. Midnight, I'd stand outside his door, turn the latch. <laughs> Open the door slowly, slowly, slow, now. The old man's sleep must not be disturbed. There was just enough space for me to slip my head and in and peek into the room. Good night. Oh, good night. See you in the morning. A whole hour of the stakes. Would the mad do this? Would the mad be so precise? Good night. Oh, good night. See you in the morning. Would the 
Imagine this seven nights. Midnight comes, turn the latch, open the door slowly, now peek, and again. Good night. <laughs> did me a wrong, I was waiting for the eye. Uh. The evening comes, midnight, latch. Uh, who's there? nothing but the wind in the chimney. He tries to wave him away. It is nothing but a mouse on the floor. Trying to comfort himself in vain. It is merely a cricket. But he knows in his heart. Is, is anyone there? Death stands with his black shadow before him. It is nothing, nothing. Death approaches. Ah, there. No, no. Sorry to disturb you at such a late hour. Why, it's no trouble. What has brought the police to my door? The neighbors heard a shriek. They suspect foul play. My goodness. May we search the premises? By all means, officers, by all means. The shriek, I'm afraid of my own. A bad dream. The owner, away, the owner is away in the country. Here, here is his room. Everything looks all right. Sorry to have disturbed you. Please, have a seat. Won't you? You must be weary from all this late night adventure. Thank you. Thank you indeed. It's no trouble. We appreciate your cooperation. As you can see, there is uh, nothing, nothing. Else. As you can see, there is uh, nothing, nothing. Do you? Yes. Nothing. Do you hear that? We often get these calls, so I'll have to be checked out. Stop it. Remember the body in the basement, Billy? Sure do. They must. They must know what I have done. And all because of a, all because of a neighbor who put in an odd noise. And then there was a body in the garden. Remember that? It, we would have never found that without that dog. Oh, that dog. Dug right down to a pair of hands. They're mocking at me, laughing at me. I can't take this anymore. Billions, hide no more. I am empty. Terrible place. Here, here. Please excuse me. I fan myself because I find the air in this room quite dry. There is a real and true reason for this action. I am not perspiring due to any sense of fear. Not at all. That will be false and unladylike. Some poetry, perhaps. My brother, half-brother, I understand was also known for his poetic phrases, the bells. The childlike wonder of winter fun. The romantic wonders of true love. The horror of senseless death. The evil of ghouls dancing on your grave. Hear the sledges with the bells. What a world of merriment their melody foretells. 
how they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with the crystalline delight. In a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintin abulation that so musically wells from the bell. Bells, 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 bells. From the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells. What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. From the molten golden notes, and all in tune, what liquid ditty floats. To the turtle dove that listens while she goats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it dwells in the future. Of the rapture that impels. To the swinging and the ringing of the bells. Bells, bells, bells. Bells, 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 bells. The rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarm bells. What a tale of terror now the turbulency tells in the startled ear of night of a scream out there of fright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek. Out of tune and the clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire. In a mad expostulation with a deaf and frantic fire with a desperate desire and a resolute endeavor now not to sit or never by the side of the pale face moon what a tale the terror tells of despair what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air yet the ear fully knows by the twanging how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells. In the jangling. And the wrangling. How the danger sinks and swells. By the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells. Of the bells. Of, of the, the bells. Bells, 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 bells. In the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells. <sighs> what a world of solemn thought that melody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with fright at the melancholy madness of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, <sighs> they that dwell up in the steep all alone, and who tolling, tolling, tolling in that muffled monotone, feel a glory so rolling on the human heart of stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. <laughs> And the king it is who tolls, and, and he rolls, 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 rolls. A paean from the bells, and his merry whistle swells with the paean of the bells. And he dances, and he yells, in a sort of runic rhyme, to the paean of the bells. Keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, bells. To the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy rhythmic rhyme. To the rolling of the bells, to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. What a strange way to end it, and it started off so nicely. That was not a shudder of fear. I have a chill. I find this room quite cold, dry and cold. Ah, this next story is about art. That's much better. A very Gentile pastime, an appropriate pastime for a lady. I dedicated many an afternoon to an easel in oils, painting a bouquet of flowers. Ah, lovely. The Oval Portrait.
I have serious doubts that my brother, half-brother, wrote anything sensible at all. What on earth is his thinking? I'm almost convinced not to turn the page for fear what is written there. Fear? Nonsense. There is nothing to be afraid of. There is something very strange in the manner in which everyone is attired here this evening. Are you not aware of the proper dress for young gentlemen and ladies when you go out on the town? It's quite shameful. I almost have half the mind to vacate the premises at once. I certainly will be doing so once this engagement is complete. Of that you can be assured. Ah, this next story is not of the frightening variety at all. It is a comedy. They'll remain to be seen. I rarely find humor in anything. This comedy is called Lionizing. I am that is to say I was a great man. My name is Robert Jones. I was born somewhere in the city of Fum Fudge, and I have a nose. Oh, what Said my mother. Son. Said my father. And to that, I grasped my nose with both of my hands, all through my childhood until the day I came of age. Said my father. My father, it is the study of nosology. He inquired. Sir, it is the study of noses. He demanded. A nose, my father, has been various defined by a thousand different authors over the years. It is now noon. We shall have time enough to get through all of them by midnight. To begin, the nose, according to Bartholinus, is... Such a smart man. Do you really think so, father? I considered this fortunate and resolved to following my paternal advice. I determined to follow my nose. I wrote a pamphlet on nosology on the spot. Thumb fudge was in an uproar. Yes. Superb Clever fellow. Thinker. Oh, go on. I mean it. Go on. Great man. Divine soul. Who can he be? What can he be? Where can he be? Where indeed, I pay these people no mind. I'm after bigger fish. A celebrity in a small pond is no celebrity at all. The scene unfolds itself in the artist's shop. The Duchess of Bless My Soul sits for her portrait. The Marquis of So-and-So holds the Duchess's poodle. The Earl of This and That flirts with her salt. Oh, beautiful. Oh, my. Oh, shocking. A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. Do you warrant it? I do. Is it quite original? <laughs> None. A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds? Precisely. A thousand pounds. Just so. You shall have it. I should draw up a check on the spot. I became the talk of the town, that sad little rake. The Prince of Wales invited me to dinner. The scene was set with all the established elegancy. Did you know the earth is supported by a sky blue cow with an incalculable number of green horns? I know exactly. And myself, oh, myself, I spoke of myself, 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 nosology, myself, my pamphlets, myself, my nose, and myself. Marvelous, clever fellow. Will you go to Alma's pretty feature? Upon honor, dear Duchess. Nose and all? As I live. Here then is a card, my life. So I say you'll be there? Dear Duchess, with all my heart. Shah, no, with all your nose? Oh, Mac, the rooms are crowded to suffocation. He is coming! Said someone on the staircase. He is coming! Said someone farther up. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. Sir, 
Elector of Blundenough. You are a baboon. A duel was the only answer. We exchanged cards, and the next morning... Ready? Ready. Bang! His nose! You saw him his nose! Success! This would take me to new heights. I called on all of my friends. Father, son, father, son, son, son. What is the chief end of my existence? Well, my son is still the study of nosology, but by hanging the left fine nose, you will shock the market. Do I not have a fine nose? You have a fine nose, it is true, but London of Pheasant Island, he has become the hero of the day. I grant you that in Funk Fudge, the greatness of the lion was in proportion to the size of his nose. For good heavens, there's no competing with the lion who has no nose at all. There's a note here in the raven, which surely must be a mistake. It is written here that the raven was written in 1845. That's impossible. That year has not happened yet. Edgar certainly does not have the ability to write premonitions. Someone was being lazy with their note-taking here, clearly. <laughs> the Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume or forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my books surcrease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. Whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never seen before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating. Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly. That is scarce was sure I heard you. Here I open wide the door. Darkness there and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lanoa. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lanoa. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turned, all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I will tap it, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is, something at my window lattice. Let me see then what the rack is, and the mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in stepped the stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he. But with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. 
Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. The raven, sitting lonely on the glassy bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing far than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, though I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply, so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I. What it utters is his only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom a merciful disaster follow fast and follow faster till his songs one burden bore. Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking. Nevermore. This, this I sat engaging, guessing, but no, no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er. She shall press on nevermore. Then, then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch! I cried, thy God hath meant thee, by these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite and nepent thee from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepent thee, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there a balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if a bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aiden, it shall clasp a fated maiden, whom the angels name the Lord, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name the Lord. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming through 
throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. I have a very keen eye and a sharp attention to detail. Not only are many of you not dressed in an appropriate manner, it appears I am the only lady adequately attired. Shocking! I simply cannot be seen amongst such disregard to what it means to be a true lady. With such an imbalance, it's almost as if I'm the one out of place, out of time, which, you must agree, is ludicrous. Why would I be out of time? Why, the thought is simply inconceivable, absurd. I know who I am and where I am and how young ladies and gentlemen should be dressed. It's the stories, these stories have addled my brain, much as my brother, half-brothers, has become. In his mind, he would suggest that if I'm out of time, there must be something wrong with me. I must be dead, perhaps a ghost wandering the earth, unaware of my state. I must leave at once. I've spent more than enough time with my brother's words. The next story you'll have to experience on your own. The Mask of Red Death. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. I saw it happen to my chamber maid. No, no, shit, long fiend vanished. I walked through the part of the window. Thank goodness. She screamed and cried and started fleeing out, well, well, everywhere. How lucky are we? Lucky are we what? To be safe and sound in here. Pizza chamber made flat out everywhere. Oh, yes, quite the sight. Hideous, I must say. Did you see that for us? Oh, yes, quite the sight. Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! Hip hip hooray! When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned a thousand friends from among the knights and dames of his court. And there retired the deepest The abbey was surrounded by a strong high wall with gates of iron. And when the courtiers entered, well did the bolts shut. There was no way in. We were just kind of other, our, our, our lucky stars, dear prince. We're so lucky to be in here, not out there facing God. Ah, look at the majesty, very high time. Yes, prince. Raged most furiously, Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends. My friends, my friends, you must make an announcement. Tonight, we shall have a ball, a masquerade. Right. whose colors match the decorations of the chamber. The first room is vividly blue, blue, and purple. The second chamber is purple in its ornaments and tapestries. The third was green throughout. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange. Unbelievable. The fifth was white. The sixth was violet. Prado. The seventh room was shrouded in black tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and walls. But in this chamber only, color of the windows differ from the other. Here, the paint was scarlet, a deep blood color. And the effect of the light that streamed through the blood tinted panes was gossip. Prince, may I suggest that we begin our merriment in the blue room? Hooray! In the seventh room, there also stood a gigantic clock. A 
Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the hour struck, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound that was clear and loud and deep. It caused the musicians of the orchestra to pause. The waltzers see. The giddiest grew pale. None. And the Red Death 